Um, so a fantastic panel here. Um, we have uh, Neil Chilson first, the head of AI policy at the Abundance Institute, also the former FTC chief technologist during the, the, during the first Trump administration. Um, also, Cara Frederick, um, the director of the Tech Policy Center at the Heritage Foundation, and Brandon Pugh, uh, the director and a senior fellow for cybersecurity and emerging threats at the R Street Institute. So thank you so much for being with, here with me. Um, I'd love to just start with a few kind of high level thoughts on the Trump administration's approach to AI, um, you know, just kind of um, keeping it, uh, you know, brief and high level to start. What are some of your expectations? And we can dive more into the details as we go along today. Uh, sure, so uh, really high level. Um, you know, we're not working off of a blank slate here. The Trump administration actually uh, did uh, some pretty substantive work on artificial intelligence policy at the federal level, uh, including an executive order. Um, and so that vision was one of optimism, uh, one of a powerful tool that can be useful both um, uh, to civil society, but also to, to government and to defense. And I think we'll see that uh, much more now. So I expect a turn from the sort of uh, skepticism about how this might affect society uh, and much more towards an optimism and more than that a sort of necessity of, of keeping the lead in this technology vis-a-vis um, -vis China. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And you think about the, the early conversations that we had in the first Trump administration about AI. Um, in the public consciousness, there was a lot of killer robots, there was a lot of Terminator, there was a lot of Skynet, and you almost don't hear that at all. And I think it's going to hew more towards um, sort of when the RNC opened, you saw the platform was, was very pro-crypto, very pro-space, very pro-AI. I think they're all, all part and parcel. It's this pro-innovation platform. Uh, I like to call it an affirm agenda for these emerging technologies. That's what we are trying to, um, you know, I don't speak for anybody, but on the conservative side, but myself and the Heritage Foundation, um, we're, we're trying to engender an idea of these technologies as, as I said before, affirmative, as positive, as something that is going to work for the everyday American, something that is going to work for Western values, for American values, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the more autocratic, um, shall we say, CCP-oriented values um, that are I would say quickly achieving parity uh, in some instances of AI progress. So we are presenting uh, a vision, uh, we think, as conservative that's very uh, to the moon, to Mars-esque, uh, shall we say, and uh, uh, less regulatory constraints, uh, no more deserts, but uh, building cities that work for the every American, uh, and when I say cities, I mean, you know, the, the uh, things that are AI-driven, technology-driven in a good way. Um, and I, I also think that there's, there's a prevailing ethos from the people that we've seen fill positions already that is more like uh, cheaper, faster, more. So we're gonna see less uh, bespoke programs, you know, no more lumbering um, unique platforms. It's going to be let a thousand um, Anderils bloom, let a thousand Palantirs bloom, let a thousand uh, scale AIs bloom. And I think that's going to be sort of the preva prevailing narrative that you see from the, the administration going forward. Pro-innovation, uh, pro-AI development, uh, pro-AI progress. Yeah, I, I share many of those points. And I think it's also important to keep in mind how this fits into the incoming administration's views on deregulation in general. I don't see AI being an exception for that, whether that be the Department of Government Efficiency or just the vow to, you know, on one end, cut 10 regulations for every new one. I, you know, AI, I don't, I don't see being an exception. And to Neil's point, we largely saw that with the 2019 executive order and the subsequent 2020 guidance. There was numerous parts in there that said, look, let's look for ways to make this easier, both in industry, let's streamline this, let's look for ways we can uh, you know, cut red tape and really return to an you know, opportunity where we're actually very you know, encouraged by the, the promise that AI has. You know, rather than this pessimistic view, like, you know, Carol was kind of alluding to that some held for a long time. Fortunately, we've gotten away from that a little bit in DC. It still exists. But naturally, I am an optimist. And I will say that doesn't mean there is no room for guardrails. And I think under the first Trump administration, you know, we saw that. There was, a, you know, an opportunity to really, you know, capitalize on the technology, but do so in a responsible way. And I think we'll largely re return to that. 
So when you're talking about um, a, you know, a deregulatory agenda, an agenda that promotes this innovation, um, what does that mean more specifically for some of the, the regulations? So we have the Biden administration has issued um, an executive order recently, a national security memo. Um, do you think that that executive order would be you know, fully or partially repealed? And what are some other expectations for uh, regulation? So I don't know if we're going to keep doing well, that. Well, I think everyone wants to jump in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank sure. you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, they, they've telegraphed the idea that they are going to revoke the, the current Biden administration EO. Um, but I think there are two things at issue here that they'll, they'll particularly focus on. And um, number one is the idea of, of making an environment that's permissive for open source models to flourish. Um, so instead of having these overburdensome licensing or certification procedures, that's what the, this less regulation um, environment, in my mind at least, looks like, is have a, a world where, uh, you know, a lot of these foundation models are open source, where even, um, you know, Vice President-elect telegraphed it himself. He, he said, um, open source is a hedge against censorship. You know, we don't want to see what happened with Google's Gemini model, um, which, you know, I used to work in Silicon Valley. We know that was red teamed. We know people were comfortable with the outputs, and we know that the outputs were very ahistorical. They were biased. They were inaccurate. And we don't want to see that happen over and over again um, if there's a regulatory moat built around Google that says Google is the only safe, you know, um, builder of these AI models. So therefore, they're the only ones who can, you know, now the rest of the technologies have to, and startups and new entrants have to build on top of foundation models like something uh, that Gemini is going to give us. So I think what less regulation means is having a, a, a permissive environment for these open source models to flourish that can act as a hedge against censorship, so not letting these big tech companies be the only ones in control, and then not really having um, a thresholds on, or just restrictions on the ability for individuals to compute. Um, my friend James Poulos, a long time ago, testified in front of Congress and said, we need a second amendment for compute. Now I've seen that taken up on X, if you guys have been uh, very online like myself. Now that's just starting to percolate um, among uh, a lot of the people who kind of matter in these circles because unlike uh, 10 to the 26 flops, yes, we know that it's going to cost $100 million to train a model like that and only some companies are capable of doing that. But in the end, uh, I do think that becomes a slippery slope leading down to individual compute. And we don't want to put any limitations on that because we want every American, every American family, every American community to have access to those, uh, to the ability to process and, um, and use compute no matter, um, uh, no matter what they're intending to do with it right now. Um, and I'll save my screed on AI safety, but I do think it's kind of important um, um, and is going to matter in the next four years, too. Uh, yeah, we can get to AI safety. Yeah. So uh, on the executive order, I think, yeah, I mean, it was part of the GOP platform to repeal it. I think it will be replaced. I think it, it wasn't a very regulatory executive order because there are limits to what uh, the president can do. Um, what it did was set a lot of the administrative state into nerding harder about AI in their in their spheres, uh, and so there's a there was a lot of rulemakings, a lot of uh, comment periods, a lot of reports that are uh, were written, and I think there's some that are ongoing. Maybe a lot of that is paused. Um, there certainly was the provisions that use the Defense Production Act to require transparency reporting. I think those go away. I think they're probably unconstitutional, and I don't see a replace that comes back uh, in, under a Biden or sorry under a, a Trump um, executive order in this space. Um, but I do think that, uh, and the one other big em emphasis change is that the Biden uh, executive order, building on the AI Bill of Rights and some other things that the Biden administration did, really took this fairness, um, accountability, and transparency framework that kind of comes from the privacy space, and they brought it over to AI. And the, the executive order is, is full of that type of language that talks about algorithmic bias and and I think that just won't be the kind of, that won't be the primary or even secondary uh, emphasis of a Trump administration in an executive order. It will be focused much more on what can we do to uh, enable this technology both in the commercial sector and in the government sector. And, and a lot of that means cutting back on restrictions on, say, government use of data or, uh, or exploring areas where um, federal preemption might make sense given the, the mass of state legislation that's happening right now.
Yeah, and I think one of the early concerns around the executive order was really the regulatory approach it was taking. I mean, matter of fact, the president in his, in his uh, remarks around that actually called for rig rigorous regulation. And I just think that is an approach and mentality we're not going to see uh, under an incoming administration. You know, regulation is not the answer to our problems. Um, Rather, the first Trump administration leaned on soft law, looking at standards and best practices and guardrails, rather than jumping into a very regulatory and enforcement-backed approach. And not to say there's not some good in that. I know, um, like there are, there are. From a, I come from a cybersecurity background. There are beneficial aspects of that for security, and I think that gets to the point where a lot was thrown under the executive order, and that's how they kind of marketed it. But every there are so many activities underneath that, and some of which actually started under the first administration. Um, so the question will be is what is it replaced with, how much carries over, even if it is in fact repealed, which, like Neil, I fully expect to happen. But to the second part of your question around the National Security Memorandum, I'm not sure how many read that or, or have been following that. In my opinion, actually, it took a much different uh, approach. Um, you know, maybe I'm pessimistic, but I saw the executive order as being, if anything, like hampering innovation. The NSM actually came out the opposite, saying, let's fully utilize the technology. If we don't, we're going to cede our leadership position in the world. There's going to be consequences to our defense uh, base by the same administration, which is very interesting. And I think, though, there's actually more risk on the defense side, because I would hate to see a scenario where we either prohibit an application or deem it higher risk, subject to a lot of oversight, unfairly, realizing that our adversaries and competitors like China are not going to follow that. So I think we do, it is incumbent on us, because we are a democracy, is to, to you know, have guardrails, but we don't want to set ourselves up for failure, which I think you know, if we continue down the path we're going is, is a possibility. And um, Kari, you brought up the AI Safety Institute. So what do you, what do you think about the, you know, the future survival of that? Um, <laughs> Uh, I did note that um, Ted Cruz had, had alleged in a recent letter that the Europeans were trying to influence AI regulations in the U.S. and talked about um, you know that institute and um, as being the product of a radical left. Um, but on the other hand, you have someone like Elon Musk, for example, who's backed um, a California bill that requires large-scale models to undergo safety testing. Um, where do you think some of the you know, Trump administration perspectives on safety will come down? Yeah, I think in terms of, I'm with Brendan when it, guardrails matter. And uh, I don't think uh, the Wild West hasn't worked out in other areas of um, the tech space. And I don't think it will necessarily work out with AI um, absent guardrails. So um, that's my caveat. And then I'll say, for good or for ill, I think the, the word AI safety has been poisoned. Um, I think that it, do, it is radioactive in some um, very conservative circles. Um, which side wins the day, I don't know, because um, Elon has been very forward-leaning when it comes to potential existential risks when it comes to AGI and whatnot. Um, there was a time, and people will remember this, where we thought uh, AGI was just um, you know, wizardry and, and for the charlatans, but um, you know, there are very serious people who, who do say it's, it's right around the corner. Um, and I think Elon Musk has been warning a lot of um, those potential dangers. So, so I do think we need to, to put some constraints. Um, I, I like to say I'm not an open source absolutist, um, even though, but more open source is typically better than uh, less open source. So I think in the end, um, there's a big problem when it comes to using emerging technologies that the US government has uh, faced in part because of its own doing. And I know this because I used to work in the counterterrorism digital space, uh, both in government and outside government, is we create these tools that are ostensibly for noble purposes, and then they're perverted and at times turned inward on the American people, especially when it comes to digital surveillance tools and whatnot. So we need to draw bright lines, I think, when we're talking about things like AI safety. Um, siloing things like this to a pure national security remit I think would be very advantageous if the, the pro-AI safety um, people in the crowd want to see their agenda enacted. So it has to be constrained by um, pure national security implications, not made up, not expanded, not inflated, um, you know, as we've seen in the counterterrorism sphere where um, foreign Islamist terrorism became, you know, domestic extremists became uh, people who go to TLM mass and uh, parents at school board meetings. So we need to be very, very careful when we talk about AI safety. I think it's, it's, it's a critical uh, component of uh, AI governance, but it has been poisoned. 
There's merit behind people who think it's been poisoned. And if you look at pure national, cons national security constraints in that bright line, you're going to go farther if you're pro-AI safety than not. Yeah, as a quick follow-up, mm -hmm. I think what Kara's getting at is that there's really no universal uh, definition for this. Mm -hmm. What you view as, as AI safety may be much different than I. I mean, it's a good example that I think, you know, we've seen the AI safety needs to do a lot of work around AI red teaming. And I think that has value to a smaller company that is just not sophisticated enough to walk through that themselves. On the other hand, we have seen them go down paths that are very different than what the average person would think of when we, we talk about AI safety. I think that's the challenge, is really how do we strike that balance? Um, I mean, I think in fairness, NIST has done a lot of good work on the cybersecurity front as well, so I'd hate to see efforts like that uh, you know, done away with. But I, I don't think it's advantageous to continue down the path that we've done now. And I think that's the reason we've seen, notably, Senate Republicans express concerns around the AI Safety Institute. What's interesting, though, is that's not universal. We've also seen House Republicans you know, propose and continue bills that want to codify the AI Safety Institute. So it'll be interesting to see how that actually plays out next year. Um, it's, not, it's not crystal clear to me. I mean, I always have to check my phone, but you know, we should be seeing the House AI Task Force report come out um, really any day now. Um, if it's not out as, as we're speaking. Uh, it's not last night. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's one of those things. You have to always update X because it's you know, DC timelines. But yeah. Uh, on the, the role that NIST has played, I think it's been, it's been a great uh, institute. And I think part of the risk of the AI Safety Institute has been politicizing overall NIST uh, efforts, which are critical across a wide range of issues. And so... Um, so I don't know exactly, you know, the AI Safety Institute was created by the executive order, so if the executive order is repealed, that doesn't necessarily mean it goes away unless the Trump replaces and, and actually says that it, it needs to go away. Mm -hmm. um, but the safety debate is, is complicated because there's a wide range of, uh, the, the terms are so broad and the people who identify in different sectors, there's a big of like existential risk folks who worry that AI is going to kill us all. And that has been, that's a small but very loud mi uh, yes. minority. Um, and that sort of bled out into a lot of the policy space. And that's made it very complicated to actually have um, uh, sophisticated conversations uh, often. And so I do think that that rhetoric uh, was early into DC and sort of has faded, at least to Congress. And, and, but it's not going to stop um, coming. And so when I think about somebody like Elon Musk, who has has some of those concerns, but is very much not a red tape kind of guy. Um, it's interesting to think about how that will play out in, in AI policy specifically. Um, there is some risk, I think, that the AI safety folks whose main goal is to slow down this technology uh, worldwide until we can get enough uh, control over it, as, as they might say, um, are going to pair sort of more with the AI ethics folks who believe that um, you know, we need regulation to make sure that it's fair, et cetera, et cetera, and it impact, impacts society. Not because they really think that those are the important issues, but because they think that's a way to slow down the technology. And they might be right. Mm -hmm. But you can also sort of shoot the gap, too, with technical remedies. So, so open sourcing, the open source community can help identify and, and, and really fix some of these potential malicious uses before they're uh, deployed. So I think that could potentially be that balance and the solution to that balance as well if we let open source technologies prevail. Yeah, and I think it, it is also a matter, I think, of scaling back. Saying if the AI Safety Institute stays, I think they've taken on some aspects of their portfolio that should not continue. For instance, like on the national security side of the House, the NSM, the National Security Memorandum, gives, let's see if I'm, I'm right, I'm always hesitant to give exact stats in a, in a panel, but let's say I think it's roughly 23 call-outs for the AI Safety Institute. And in my, my opinion, at least, for what that's worth, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a large role for the AI Safety Institute to have oversight or involvement with national security related activities. And that's what they've gotten in the National Security Memorandum. I don't want to overstate that. It's not every aspect of the NSM, but there are many co aspects where a civilian agency is now coordinating and having an oversight role over DOD activities. I don't think that's appropriate. Okay. Um, I wanted to shift internationally, talk about China for a minute. Um, there's obviously been a lot of concern about the um, country's access and development of artificial intelligence chips and work on the export control front. Um, there are also concerns about China, you know, potentially exploiting um, data in the United States. What do you see as kind of the most pressing concerns that the Trump administration would want to address? And, you know, is there any, um, you know, overlap or a lot of difference with the Biden administration? 
So, I, I mean, I, I think the most important thing that the uh, Trump administration will have to address is, you know, right now the AI community is largely in a permissionless space, right? Like they can build products, they can bring them to market, they can test them uh, in the market, and, and, and there isn't a, a big approval process that might slow things down, which some of the big companies could handle and some of the small companies would struggle or open source companies would struggle with. Um, I think the number one objective is to keep that engine going. Like the U.S. is the leader in this space, uh, both on the hardware and on the software side, and we, we really need to stay there. Um, and, and I think that that will be the primary uh, goal. Now, there's lots of other things about how they do that. Um, some of them are you know, tariff-based or export control-based. Um, some of them might be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, maybe it's government investment or infrastructure building or things like that. But, um, but I think primarily that's, that's, the, that's, that's how we win. We don't beat China by, you know, adopting a China-like approach to this technology because the U.S. approach has been uh, really, really, really successful so far. So I think we should lean into what we're good at, uh, developing new things, um, investment, uh, capital, uh, capital markets, and, uh, and competition, and, uh, and not try to hem it in uh, and make sure that we're not getting in our own way. Yeah, that's not wrong, but, but what I'm sort of seeing in the undertones of that are the idea that we have a cohort of big tech companies right now that are actively working with the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you look at Amazon, you look at Google, um, even General Dunford way back in, what, 2017, he basically said um, any Google's work on AI in China is an indirect contribution to the PLA. Then he corrected himself, no, it's a direct contribution to the PLA. So I think, um, as one of my friends always says, US big tech companies are going to have to pick a flag. And it should be the stars and bars, and not China. And I, I do think that the, the Trump administration will wake a lot of these companies up to that. Um, if you look at people who've contested the primes, like I'll invoke Andrew again, uh, one of the big things that that company did when it was coming on the scene um, in, gosh, uh, well, at least when I heard of them in 2017, 2018, um, was that they had a big American flag on the masthead of a microsite when you were applying for jobs. So you had, there was no equivocation when it came to what side that company was building for. Uh, so everyone's heard of American dynamism right now. Everyone probably sees the clips of Alex Karp uh, talking at the Reagan Defense Forum where he basically says, no, we think our enemies should be scared. And he builds defense technologies to scare our enemies, to restore some semblance of deterrence. So I think we, uh, the, the Trump administration will take a hard line on China again, as they had in, in the first administration. Um, and they'll also start to um, nudge these big tech firms to actually pick the American flag as their primary customer and pretty much stop their incursions into China, I can hope. Yeah, no, and I hear what you're saying. I would say the only caveat to that would be is we need to really be setting up all of our companies, regardless of they're small or big, up for success. Because, I mean, it's not like what it was decades, and not, this is not a contrary to you, it's not like what it was decades ago where like, it was usually the government being the innovator, government was generating our new technology the military was leaning on. It's the exact opposite. The government's doing a lot of good work in AI, but it's largely industry is leading here. We're largely adopting their, their technologies or we're iterating from it. So I... I I think we'll see the incoming administration really fall to that type of environment, whether they're big tech or you know small tech, if you if you will. Um, I, to your point specifically, though, like I, I agree with what they're saying. You you, you flag data. This is uh, for anybody in the audience. I know I have friends here that, uh, that that know me. I'll never resist an opportunity to talk about data. I mean, we know, um, and I will connect to AI. Don't worry. Um, you know, we know China has been collecting as much information on their own citizens, our allies, and on Americans for unfortunately decades. Um, and it's really all facets of life. I mean, the one concerning aspect of that is now how they're able to make sense and parse that data much quicker and much easier leveraging AI. Um, and I think regardless of what we do from a regulatory or legal standpoint in the US, they're going to do that regardless. So that's just a fact of the matter. We have to, we have to realize that. But we need to be, we can leverage AI accordingly now to combat those uses uh, and perhaps, you know, make all, you know, make our uses of, that, of similar data that we hold even, even more efficient. Um, so that is one, one potential fear I have with China, um, and I, I don't see that slowing down. And I do agree with Kara, the, the concerns with China are, are only going to increase, I think, under the new, new administration, and, and rightfully so. Um, there's, we have to take it at face value. I mean, the, the CCP has said by 2030 they want to be the, the world leader in AI, if not quicker. 
Um, you know, we can agree or disagree if that's actually a reality, but we should be a plan accordingly and not losing our leadership position. Can, since we're talking international, I'll expand it a little bit, but it's still a bank shot through mm -hmm. China, which is Europe. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to ask. I, I do think that there's at, at some point, um, and we've heard we heard some of this uh, this discussion on the campaign trail um, that. American companies uh, who have been sort of subject to this, these specific rules in Europe, which are treating you know, US companies and US shareholders as uh, a piggy bank in many cases, uh, by setting thresholds at which, you know, and certain regulatory regimes that apply to just a very few small, uh, very few large companies that are all uh, based in the US, um, and then just below that gap, are Chinese companies who are flooding, uh, who, are, who are going into uh, Europe to fill that gap. And so I think at some point, the Trump administration is going to look and say, like, why is Europe kicking American companies in the teeth and letting Chinese companies in? And I think that, I think that will be a problem for Europe. Mm -hmm. And the Middle East, too. I think that you know, we can't ignore, or we can't talk about every corner of the world, but I think mm -hmm. um, what we've seen uh, with UAE, what we've seen with their ability to um, build and concentrate these data centers and their capabilities, uh, I think that's something that we need to absolutely keep an eye on as well. Because as we know, especially with a lot of the digital surveillance technologies, um, they're not exactly behaving as, as Western uh, democracies would, uh, getting their hands on these technologies. Mm -hmm. Well, since the EU came up, I can't resist talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, EU AI could be its own, its own panel. I know we have many friends from the EU here today. So I will say, like, I, I'm sure that works in the EU for many, many countries there. That the the EU version of tech legislation is not traditionally the US view. And I think that's concerning. I mean, we saw the EU really lead when it came to privacy with the GDPR. And by default, many US companies have really followed that because it's a strict standard and we don't have a privacy law here. So I think that is the risk we see is how many US companies now go down that path, follow the EU AI Act, which, you know, I know there's probably mixed feelings here. I tend to be more on the opposite side of it. I think there are some aspects of it that are decent, uh, but there's just as many, if not more, that are concerning. Um, so that's just something for us to grapple with in terms of what are countries around the world doing. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a former FTC, -er, I have to say, we in the US actually have many privacy laws. We just don't have one <laughs> fair, 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 comprehensive uh, 100%. one. 100%. <laughs> you know, you, no, in that, you're, you're right. I mean, the number of sectoral privacy laws we have in this I don't want to turn this into a privacy panel. <laughs> we have many, and then not to mention the number of states that have privacy laws, um, good or bad. We don't have a, a GDPR like uh, here. I wanted to go back to the um, Middle East just for a moment. So there has been a debate over, um, you know, issuing licenses to supply AI chips to the Middle East. Have you done um, any work on this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, any thoughts about what direction, you know, that could go in partnerships in, in the Middle East, openness to, to trade there or, or lack thereof? I mean, I think it's ambiguous. Um, mm -hmm. Again, uh, knowing how these uh, technologies have been exploited uh, in the past, um, I, I do think there's a little bit of cause for concern there, but at the same time, resources, right? What do you need for, for good AI? You need a heck of a lot of compute, uh, and, and they, they got it. You need a lot of resources, they got it. You need a, a high volume and variety of data, they're working on it. You need the ability to, and the uh, physical structures to process it. And they can, um, I think, and, and I've heard this before, I'm not the first to say it, but they would, they would desire to fill the entire desert filled with data centers if they could. Um, so, uh, so I definitely think that is going to be a sensitive relationship that the Trump administration will have to navigate. Um, they've been fruitful partners in other aspects of international relations. You look at the Abraham Accords, uh, that never would have worked without uh, the partnership of Arab nations. So, so I do think as long as um, there's a healthy realism injected into potential partnerships, um, they could be lucrative, and they could potentially, again, uh, create some sort of a bulwark against an ascendant China if China, who obviously wants to get in there first, um, doesn't make as uh, prodigious an incursion as, as they're trying to at this point. You know, we know that they've um, been very successful in Latin America, the Global South, uh, in Africa right now. So. I would like to see us co-opt as many what I call swing states and sort of a mix between authoritarian and hybrid governance. Um, we, we call India and Brazil more on this sideline, uh, this scale, vice, um, you know, the UAE and other Middle Eastern nations. But I would like to create as big a buffer uh, between uh, China and the West as possible. And some nations could help us do that. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I, we've, we've sort of been talking in a sort of us versus them uh, a little bit here. And I just want to say, you know, take this opportunity to say that AI is a really powerful uh, uh, technology that can bring a lot of benefits. And those benefits should be widely felt uh, around the world. And I think um, they shouldn't just be the, it shouldn't just be the US that benefits from it. We should lead because I think um, we can bring uh, our, our values uh, uh, and our uh, economic value to the world. But, um, but those, those technologies are powerful and there's a lot of people around the world that could benefit from the health and transportation and safety uh, aspects of it over time. I'll go ahead and open it up for audience questions in just a minute. Um, I did want to ask, um, you know, you touched uh, a bit on investment. We talked about, um, you know, we've kind of been talking about um, government and private partnerships. Um, there, in its most recent report, the U.S.-China Economic and Security Commission urged a Manhattan-style project in the U.S. to develop artificial uh, artificial general intelligence. Um, I was curious if what you think about uh, that or kind of other, you know, big government approaches. Um, you know, also in the Trump administration, I, I think um, uh, the president-elect has, you know, expressed some kind of skepticism of industrial policy. Does a big project like that, you know, fit in that framework? So, uh, I mean, there's lots of ways to tackle this question. Um, I'll just say I think AGI is overrated. Not that it isn't an amazing technology if it, if it happens, but, um, but people sort of have this idea about AGI that it is, the, it is a, not only is it sort of near, but then once that's, that happens, we have this quick takeoff. Um, we already have artificial super intelligence. Uh, it's called the economy. It's called uh, cooperation. It's, it's we, as, any, as individuals, yes, we're intelligent but us collectively are, are super intelligent. And what we can do uh, in this space is, is pretty amazing. And when I think about like, how computers will fit into that ecosystem, I, I think there's assumption that it will somehow take over this complex system that we have. Um, but that I think largely that's because people overrate the value, very smart people overrate the value of intelligence to getting things done in the world. And getting things done in the world is not primarily a factor of intelligence or individual intelligence, it's a factor of um, working together, cooperation, specialization, division of labor. Those are things that are not, they don't scale um, with computer power. They, um, they scale through collaboration and institutions. And so, yes, our institutions will change a lot. Do we need a Manhattan Project to do that? I don't think so. I mean, uh, we have tons of investment pouring to this space. Now, on the national security side, maybe there are some specific investments that need to happen. Um, I'll, I'll leave that to the national security experts, but... Um, uh, but I don't think achieving AGI is the sort of thing that, that we need uh, a, a Manhattan project for. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think industry does have this well covered. And I think with the advent of what I'll call the, the new right tech or the new tech right, um, we have industry leaders who bear a cognition of, you know, a, a America first realism. Um, we have... Um, people building safe super intelligence who um, have uh, imbued within their technologies Western values. Um, so in terms of a, a concerted effort uh, to create AGI um, imbued with, with democratic values, I, I'm, I'm sort of assuming that is where we're going with that. Um, I, I kind of think we have people in industry who are willing to do that now, um, which is ex Exciting! It, it's amazing. You know, there's there's not much of a schism between you know what's good for America and what's good for industry. Now we can sort of meld the two. Um, it's very exciting to us. Um, and uh, I think going forward, Bob Work uh, said what back in 2016, 2017, uh, we had a, a Sputnik moment, um, and I think people have internalized that. Industry leaders have internalized that, along with defense leaders, and now we can finally marry uh, those those two. Um, cohorts and, and achieve something great uh, without having to have that big uh, Uncle Sam pocketbook dump, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there's, a, there's room for both. I would say a select role for government, but a significantly broader role for industry. Mm -hmm. And I think just to kind of give you a concrete example of that with cybersecurity, we've seen you know, specific federal agencies that have deep expertise in cybersecurity leaning into seeing how can we further innovate around AI and cybersecurity, how can we better defend ourselves as a nation, 
leveraging the technology, and they know there are threats they're facing best. They know what the needs of their federal agencies, they know how to protect the United States. And we've seen you know, that playing out, like US Cyber Command is doing a great job on that front. But at the same time, we've seen incredible innovations at a much quicker speed coming from industry. I mean, you, you've named a few of them. I mean, looking at the work that Palantir has done is, is, is remarkable. You know, Shift 5 by seeing if an, if an attack on a weapon system is actually an attack versus an anomaly. And then even some of our larger tech companies have done tremendous work helping, you know, fight both threats to AI infrastructure itself and then also threats leveraging AI all using AI itself. I think that's really what's encouraging for me at night is how do we leverage the technology to actually make ourselves more secure. And I think it's possible. Industry is leading on that, and I think we need to get out of their way and actually let them do that. Mm -hmm. Great. Any uh, audience questions? We'll go here in the front. Right behind you. I'm a Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I see uh, a big problem here that no one's dealing with. Um, the world does not recognize that the People's Republic of China and North Korea will not respect any guardrails. I see the academics, I see uh, the government, I see commentaries and thinkers sweating bullets coming up with guardrails. And I guarantee you, none of them will be respected by the Communist Party of China. So where's Plan B? Where in the State Department is Plan B? where there are 10 guys worrying about what the world looks like when one or two countries respect no guardrails whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen that in, in biotechnologies like CRISPR, right? The, there's no scruples when it comes to there's, um, what China will do. There's no scruples when it comes to um, them cutting out organs of live <laughs> human beings uh, to experiment on them. Um, yeah, we understand that. And I think Neil's answer is pretty revealing, and it holds true here, is we just have to out-innovate. We absolutely have to out-innovate and protect ourselves at the same time. So a mixture of offense and defense, um, at least in my mind, obviously there are other applications. Um, you know, when I think of open source technologies, a lot of the pushback I've gotten for saying open source is great, open source, uh, we're all this, um, is, is the fact that, um, oh, what if China, uh, we know they're building on Llama, they, we know they're building on a lot of our open source models. Um, but if we think that they're not going to have their own indigenous capability, we're kidding ourselves. If we think that um, we're not, our big tech companies are not infiltrated by CCP spies, we are absolutely kidding ourselves. They're already there. They've already extracted uh, proprietary information from Google when it comes to building some of these AI models too. So we just have to build faster and we have to build better. I think that's the, the that's basically the only answer uh, because we're not going to protect ourselves from this rampant espionage. We're not, as my friend Josh Steinman says, we're not guarding these AI models and the proprietary information around them as if they were state secrets because they potentially are. So I think we do have to take that a little bit more seriously. But also recognize that um, espionage is always going to be with us, as you know very well from your life, um, from uh, the Chinese Communist Party, and uh, we have to exist in that reality and keep going on offense at the same time. Yeah, you know, I, I think you're 100% you're right, and that's the point I was trying to get to earlier. Is regardless of what we do from a policy or legislative standpoint here, China doesn't care. Uh, at the end of the day, they may publicly look like they care, like we see on privacy. Believe it or not, China has a privacy policy. They also have a data security policy. Whether they follow it or that's just to protect their own citizens from other governments, not their own, is a different story. Um, and that's, that's really the concern. We see China trying to get out there, win the messaging campaign, show that they are the world leader on, on technology, spe specifically AI. And that's always been my concern. Fortunately, Congress, most of Congress, has walked back these broad calls for like a comprehensive AI measure here with a new agency and licensing. Really, all that's going to do is help countries like China. That's not going to, that's not going to help us. I think that's the risk. And I, it kind of, as a further subset, we need to be hypercritical. If we, if we put out a new national security memorandum, or I should say the new incoming administration puts out a new one, making sure that balance is really clear. Because China leveraging AI in their defense uh, and intelligence community, it's not going to have boundaries. That's not to say we shouldn't have some. I, I do think there are areas of AI that, you know, Perhaps as a, as a United States and the values we uphold, we should be you know, having some guardrails, but it's a matter of getting that balance. I think recently we've not struck that balance. I'm hopeful the incoming administration is going to kind of get that balance uh, right. Can, can I add a little uh, piece of 
uh, to that, that call for getting the guardrails right. I mean, I think that the easiest way to break this down is just to say at what level in the stack are you regulating? Yeah. Um, all of these calls for comprehensive AI regulation, they're regulating at the model stack. And that is so abstract yeah. that it's hard to know exactly how to do it well. Um, and when you see bills like SB 1047 that you referenced in California, what it basically said was just make promises that it's going to go okay and then we'll see you later if it doesn't. Um, uh, because we don't really know how to set the standards. That's so abstract. Uh, the guardrails need to be at the use level and that lets us be specific to the harms that happen. And it also lets us take into account, you know, hey, like, you know, making our cars safe to drive uh, if they have AI technology in it, that doesn't, doesn't make us weaker vis-a-vis -vis China. But, but making all of our models have to pass uh, some government checklist before they even get rolled out into applications, that does make us weaker vis-a-vis -vis China. So, so I think we can identify the guardrails that, that are good for uh, consumers and for markets and to deal with market failures uh, and the ones that would just put us back without a huge amount of benefit. Okay, more questions? Um, let's go here in the middle. Uh, I am Emine Kaplan and I am a research scholar at American University. Uh, I am focused on the role of artificial intelligence in political propaganda during electoral process. So my, my question will be about that. Uh, as you know, in recent years, AI has been used in election campaigns, uh, campaign, especially in the US. To spread disinformation uh, which harms uh, democracy, do you think Trump will, will take any action to stop this? If yes, uh, what steps will be taken during uh, second Trump administration to prevent AI uh, disinformation? Because if I am, sh uh, I'm not sure, but I think there is no regulation uh, related to. Uh, that's a uh, drive an election campaign in US. Thank you. So uh, last year, uh, very early on, uh, after the release of ChatGPT, uh, but then especially ramping up last year, there were tons of projects around AI disinformation in elections. Um, we started a project at the Abundance Institute that tracked all the media coverage of all of these incidents. Um, uh, it was a big nothing burger, frankly. Um, it didn't affect uh, election outcomes in the US. And last year was a year of global elections as well. And while there were lots of incidents and lots of use of AI, um, the use of it, uh, I like to say that the, the constraint in, in lying is not the ability to manufacture lies, it's the spreading of lies. And that's the, uh, it's easy to manufacture lies. Millions of people do it online every day for free. Um, and so the, the misinformation and disinformation, the incremental effect of AI, I think, was pretty small. And I think that played out pretty true in this set of uh, elections. Now, will that always be the case? I don't know. We, can, we, can, we need to keep an eye on it. Um, the US does not have restrictions on what you can say in campaigns for some very good reasons, uh, known as the First Amendment, primarily. Um, and so the, that's the core of, of free speech, is political speech. And, and so the use of AI in that context, I think, is very difficult to regulate in the US. Um, and I think that's generally to the better uh, for the US. Yeah, and this is, sorry, I don't know if you want to no, get next. No, I, yeah, I will say this is very much an active, active question. I mean, two or three years ago, if I were to ask the room if anybody knows what CISA is, maybe two of you would have known. I will say maybe that it's not unanimous now. But I will say a lot of people know what CISA is, which is you know, our cybersecurity agency in the US, largely because of their concern around their involvement in, misses, in disinformation. That's what we've seen the incoming administration latch on to and be very critical of. And that's why we've actually seen some calls in the Senate, notably, just to completely disband that organization or move them to another federal agency. There's multiple reasons, but one of the key ones has been their alleged involvement in disinformation and in coordination with you know, tech companies as well. Um, all that to say, I, I, I will say because of that skepticism, I, I'd be surprised if we would see a concerted effort to now bring that back. I know we've seen some calls to say, well, we should stand up an independent office that looks at disinformation like some of our friends around the world have done. Um, I'm mostly with Neil. I think that is a very slippery slope to go down to once we start regulating speech. Um, 
because what is the purely domestic speech versus coming from a foreign adversary? It's hard to say. That is a very hard path to go down. I'd rather err on the side of you know, free speech, personally. I usually don't need one of these. <laughs> it's working fine. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me now? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it may take a little while for the executive orders to be rescinded and for something to come back in place. For those of us who are responsible for accelerating AI in the federal government in the non-national uh, non security, non-intelligence arena, what would be your advice? What should your marching orders, what should we focus on? What should we not focus on some more anymore? Uh, when it comes to not only what we're doing inside of the agency, but nationally and especially as we're providing technical assistance for G7, G20, those types of things. What will we do in the meantime? We're in a quagmire right now trying to figure that out and we want to comply. Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think, so the executive order is, uh, uh, like I said, a lot of it is sort of nerd harder, right? So like. Just keep nerding on, I guess. Uh, um, uh, Everyone and, in that and room. A lot of it's yeah, not exactly. particularly. Not a lot of it. A lot of it's not particularly prescriptive. Now it has it has an orientation, um, but I think you can continue to work hard to try to figure out like what are the barriers to adoption within your agency? Um, are they legal? Are they practical? Are they financial? Um, at, yeah, and 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 then help tackle those. And uh, on the international frame, I, I know less about that. I'd be happy to talk to you and learn a lot uh, after, but yeah, nerd harder. I think you'll make your lives a lot easier if you haven't done this already by having um, data processing standards. Um, you know, we're, we were big in the national security space advocates for, um, you know, open architecture with plug and play, um, you know, commercially viable technologies wherever possible, um, you know, not just um, government off the shelf, but commercially off the shelf if you could. Um, or we even advocated uh, when I was back in my old think tank for having a, a data processing scorecard and using that to evaluate your uh, potential vendors um, so that you make, when you onboard, you make it much smoother. This is how we process data. This is, um, you know, this is how we label data, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think those uh, small tweaks, if you haven't done them already, could go a long way in preparing yourself for a future that's going to be more cheaper, faster, better. Yeah, maybe slightly pessimistic we're at an AI event. I ultimately see AI as just a form of technology. I think it does have unique considerations that we don't see in other forms of technology. But with that said, some of the concerns or you know, some of the implications are already addressed by existing policy and law. So a lot of people, when I say, what are you actually concerned with? And we, we drill down into it. Sometimes it goes back to a data or a privacy or security. I'm like, well, all those are addressed in other forms of technology. Not saying that there's not uniqueness to AI, there is. But we're not starting from scratch. Like we, we as a government, we're, we're used to handling a lot of data, sometimes better than others, depending on the agency. But that's not inherent to AI. So all that to say is even if the AI executive order was rescinded on day one and there was nothing that replaced it for months, I don't think we're in this like a, you know, chaos situation. We should go back to how we've been leveraging and addressing some of these concerns for well over a decade. Okay. Um, and here in the room. Thank you all so much. Kelsey Frierson with Beacon Global Strategies. Um, I'm curious to hear, kind of building a little bit off of the mention of G7 and G20, how you envision the second Trump administration engaging in an international forum around AI and around AI infrastructure. Um, do you see a strong presence at some of the big international institutions? Do you see a focus on more of the mini-lateral, kind of direct bilateral, or one or two or three countries in a group focusing on a specific issue? Um, how, do you, how do you see the Trump administration engaging on these issues on the international stage? Well, I would, ho I would hope um, that a, a lot of this focus is, I, well, I, well, let me say what, what you won't see. You won't see big international agreements um, that will tie American companies' hands. I think uh, that's just not going to happen from this administration. Um, and, and I think that you, what, you're, what I would hope to see is that we look at some of the other policy areas um, where we're dealing, say, with you know, international uh, cross-border data flows, for example, that are making doing this type of business and providing these types of services more difficult. And so I could see, for example, some 
uh, some negotiations between the U.S. and Europe, um, with Europe trying to um, get some of these technologies deployed, maybe even with some of the, the member states um, uh, who have innovative companies uh, wanting to make sure that those companies can sell into the U.S. market um, uh, under the EU laws. And, so, and there will be some opportunities for negotiations like that um, to help you know, grease the skids of international commerce. And I think there are some fora that the incoming administration can't afford to ignore, like international standards bodies. Uh, back in 2019, China had, I think it was over 90% of AI-driven facial recognition technology standard patents. And we know, you know, as facial recognition technologies have been proliferating all over the world, um, and sensor proliferation in general, and the ability, as Brendan said before, to parse through that da data uh, now with artificial intelligence and, and have it have value and make sense of it. Um, <laughs> and lest we forget the OPM hack, the Marriott hack, the Anthem hack, the Equifax hack, Salt Typhoon, which is still ongoing. How is this not a bigger story? Yep. Um, TikTok uh, as we speak. Um, so all of these reams of seemingly disparate data sets um, are being exploited, as we used to say in the intelligence community, exploited, processed, um, and, um, and, and used uh, for ill against us. So I think we need to get involved in those standards bodies and have some say in how technology is, the designs of technologies are dictated uh, throughout the world, how technology is deployed and used throughout the world. Um, we don't want, this is another plug for open source, we don't want uh, LLMs uh, to proliferate uh, around the world that have to imbue core socialist values uh, and, and have you know, the rest of um, companies build on those, because we know the, the generative AI rules in China were finalized, and that is a, a structure. Um, so, so let's build and design products that the rest of the world wants to use, and let's not hamper ourselves by having some say in how they are used in these international forests. So I think standards bodies are, are really critical, and I'd like to see more U.S. involvement in them as well. Yeah, I mean, just being mindful of time, I, I think there's room for select engagement. Um, you know, I was fortunate to be one of the U.S. representatives to a G7 convening about I don't know, two months ago, specific to cybersecurity and regulatory harmonization. You know, super interesting. The, the goal was there's a massive patchwork around how we address cybersecurity, and AI is a critical component of that. I, I will say, like, I, it's a good to be part of those conversations. I think at the end of the day, a U.S. mentality is sometimes different than a lot of our friends around the world. At the end of the day, there were some EU countries represented that have, you know, national pro uh, ways to address cybersecurity incidents. We do not have a counterpart to that here. So getting harmonization is sometimes hard when we're just starting a completely different size of the spectrum for right reasons. So all I have to say is I'm encouraged by those conversations. I think the outcome of harmonization could be good. Getting to an actual result sometimes is challenging. Okay. We're just about a time. Um, maybe I can give you just a you know, couple, um, you know, a, a few seconds each or a little bit, bit longer to share some final thoughts. Anything you wanted to add or emphasize didn't come up. We only barely touched on it, but I do think that one thing you'll see uh, just really emphatically from the Trump administration and incoming AI czar uh, David Sachs is a conversation around um, speech and AI. And we've, we've alluded to that a little bit. Um, on the sort of communist side and the, uh, the implications there. But I think you will see a lot of uh, discussion, uh, pressure, both commercial and uh, governmental, about what are the techniques that are being used to shape the type of content that comes out of these, uh, these mechanisms and, how, and what impact does that have on speech uh, in, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, I think that's an important challenge, uh, and there's some good ways to approach this, and there's some uh, much less good ways to approach this. And so I think that's going to be a really interesting issue. Yeah, I think to, to sum it up, it's going to be an affirmative agenda. Uh, Pro-innovation, pro-little tech. Uh, if you guys have seen a lot of the announcements, um, as, as Neil alluded to, or said explicitly, um, there, there is a, a very big 
elephant in the room, and that is the censorship of, uh, of President Trump himself, um, of people who voted for him, of the base, uh, at the hands of a lot of these big tech companies. So I think there's going to be a lot of effort to, to just ensure that you know, we have a First Amendment standard again, uh, that there's no um, uh, you know, political, the policing of American speech is not something that happens uh, at scale anymore. Um, and, and frankly, I, I, I am and I remain bullish on open source. Um, we've seen it from people uh, within the administration because I think that thus far has proven to be the biggest hedge against uh, the more censorious big tech companies. Um, so so we'll, we'll look for little tech to win the day. Yeah, one thing to be on the, the lookout for too is just the role of our states, especially if you're not from the U.S. Uh, here. Uh, in the absence of a comprehensive AI measure at the federal level, I would not be surprised if we continue to see the trend of local governments, county governments, state governments uh, picking up what they perceive to be a gap. Uh, I would disagree with that, but we've seen that happen this year. I think that's only going to happen next year, much of like what we saw happen with data privacy. I think that's a challenge because that there is a scenario that in a few years, perhaps, you know, maybe not overnight, we could have 50 state AI measures that are all different and consistent. And that's already what we see playing out. Interestingly enough, even the states that have acted on the AI have essentially said, like, well, we're only acting because there's, no, there's an absence of federal action, which... Honestly, I, I disagree with. There's, it's, there's no lack of federal action. We have federal laws in the books that can address AI, just not in an overarching manner, which some of the states have won. So do not rule out looking at state governments next year, for sure. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, we're going to take a couple minutes to reset the stage. So if you want to go grab a coffee, but then please come back, because next is the fireside chat with Dr. Ben Buchanan. Thanks. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ben Buchanan, who is the White House Special Advisor for AI. Prior to that, he was the Director for Technology and National Security uh, on the National Security Council. And before entering government, he was a professor at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at its Center for Security and Emerging Technology. But that's not the important part of his past life. The important part of his past life uh, is that he used to be affiliated with the Harvard Kennedy School of Government's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, which is where I first met him way back in, I think it was 2016, uh, which I refer to the era of AI policy before it was cool. Um, and Ben was already on that train, uh, and I was also already on that train, and he was writing a fabulous paper called uh, Machine Learning for Policymakers, where AI technology has changed a lot, and yet that paper still holds up surprisingly well. Um, that was one of merely the dozens of things that he wrote that were great before he entered government. And now he has sort of, as in his role at the White Office of the White House Chief of Staff, has been leading so many different policy initiatives on AI at the Biden administration. And that's why we're so privileged to have him here for this fireside chat uh, on uh, U.S. priorities for domestic and AI in, uh, governance. So please join me with a very warm welcome for Dr. Ben Buchanan. Thanks for having me. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to have you at CSIS. We've been wanting to do this for a long time. And I was going to, I was, when I was discussing you know, what this was going to be, um, I was framing it as the Biden administration exit interview on AI, uh, but now I understand that's completely inaccurate because you're not done. Uh, there's more coming in AI policy before the conclusion of the Biden administration. 42 days to go. 42 who's, days to go. Who's counting? Uh, and, um, you know, I, here's, the, here's the one thing that gives me a little bit of frustration about that. There's some exciting developments in AI policy and uh, coming out of the Biden administration that I've been waiting for for a while, and you tell me, you know, hey, these things take time. Now you've got 42 days, and it sounds like a lot's coming <laughs> in not a lot of time, uh, which is really exciting. So we're going to get into some of that. I know you can't talk about all of it. But before we get into the next 42 days, I want to talk about these past four years, because AI really has been seminal in the Biden administration. There's so many sort of flagship initiatives that this administration has taken on. And I want to start by sort of trying to connect 
connect the dots because we just heard from one of the panelists on the previous session uh, that he thought that it read like the AI executive order and the AI Bill of Rights were written by a different presidential administration than the AI National Security Memorandum because the documents were so different. So give us your sense of you know, how the Biden administration's approach to AI policy has evolved over time. Is he wrong? Is this all very consistent? Or is he right that you know, there was sort of a, a major turning point? What's the, the Whitman line? We contain multitudes. So it, <laughs> yeah. it is true of our AI policy as well. Um, it was written by the same people. I think they're, they're consistent. I think if you, you go back in the administration, um, probably the first big public facing thing we did was the blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights. Um, Alondra Nelson, the team. This is a white paper, a yeah, non binding paper. document. Non binding yeah. document, yeah. Alondra Nelson, the team at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, deserve a lot of credit uh, for really leading that effort. And that, I think, sets out an aspiration, big picture of, of where um, our society could go uh, and should go uh, with AI. Uh, as you said, non binding, big picture before ChatGPT. So we were thinking about this before ChatGPT, obviously the chip controls on China, uh, which are related to AI were before uh, ChatGPT as well. Uh, then you have the executive order, which came out um, last year. Uh, I would describe this as taking a lot of uh, 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 what's in the vision and making it more concrete. Obviously I think a more narrow scope of, of what's in the much broader vision, but making it more uh, concrete. And that touches, uh, looks at how AI touches all across our society from healthcare to hiring to housing, uh, to some national security, but not a ton, certainly to public safety. Uh, and that is, I think, a key part of, of what we did. Those actions are done. Uh, we did 100% of those deliverables on time. Um, one of those deliverables was a national security memorandum, which is a document you just referenced that came out um, a, couple, a couple months ago that thinks about how do we take AI and apply it um, to national security, and how do we make sure that AI in the United States continues to accelerate forward and um, continues to make progress in a way that's safe and responsible. To the degree that there is a tension or a, a perception of a tension between these documents, I think it is, is because of a, a disagreement about um, the role of safety um, and careful action in acceleration. And my view is that you can go faster when you go safer. Uh, you can go faster when you are thoughtful. And the best evidence for this comes from basically every other previous paradigm of technology where setting up usually non-regulatory, as we've done no AI regulation, um, uh, rules of the road, standards, and the like, enables the technology to progress faster. If you look at the early days of the railroad, there were tons and tons of accidents. Uh, and eventually, uh, railroad companies and the government worked together to set safety standards. Uh, and trains went faster in addition to accidents going down. The same is true of aviation and the like. So uh, we have really tried to take a light touch on AI, uh, including in the executive order. Uh, but I think in the National Security Memorandum, you certainly see probably the clearest articulation of our vision for how we can uh, accelerate this technology, retain American leadership, and then ultimately use it uh, to protect our nation and advance our national security. So the AI National Security Memorandum, which if uh, folks have not read, I actually encourage you to read it. It's a pretty remarkable document. Um, I think, and I think it's fair to say that folks in the Biden administration have noted and were conscious as they were writing of some echoes between this AI national security memorandum about the national security implications of a transformative technology and the echoes with some prior legendary documents. I'm thinking like NSC 68, which was the sort of first really big stamp of what life was gonna be like in an era of nuclear weapons and then some of the, the early uh, papers that came out on space policy from some of the military services. You're kind of in that tradition. You're really the first wrestling with what I would call frontier AI, and I think this is uh, the terminology that's been embraced by the administration. But if you think about what you and I were working on in 2016, that was really about machine learning, deep learning, and especially supervised learning. Mm -hmm. And with frontier AI, it's all of that, but times a million. Um, with these large, not narrow, but general purpose models, and, and wrestling openly with what might uh, come of things like AGI, artificial general intelligence. So. You know, what really were you trying to accomplish with the AI National Security Memorandum, and what, what needs to be done before you leave office, and what you know, would have to take place during the Trump administration for it to really be successful? Okay, there's a lot here, let's, let's go in order. So I think in the, the echoes of previous documents, we will not put ourselves in that category, but I think it's fair to say we explicitly stay, say in the National Security Memorandum, this is a technology on par with those previous ones. Um, what we also say, is that for the first time, this is a revolutionary technology that is not funded by the Department of Defense. 
And if you think about the ones you mentioned, nuclear, space, I would add in the early days of the internet, uh, the early days of the microprocessor, uh, large-scale aviation, uh, large-scale IC, you know, missile deployments and the like, uh, development of radar, all of that was funded by the Department of Defense and to some degree the intelligence community. And that close link between the government and the inventors of the technology historically gave the government the capacity to understand the technology frankly, better than many in the government understand frontier AI, and also gave the government the capacity to shape the technology. And we have very little control over what companies uh, put out in the United States. It's a totally private sector-led ecosystem. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's actually a wonderful thing that private industry has taken up the mantle of this kind of innovation. The government's not paying for it. The taxpayer's not paying for it. But we get to use it. It is just a dynamic that raises a set of challenges and, and dynamics that we have to account for. And the National Security Memorandum, more than anything else, states that very explicitly. The second thing it does, which is related to your question about Frontier AI, is it says, there's a direct quote in there, this is not just about a paradigm shift to AI. This is about a paradigm shift within AI. And it is a shift exactly that you were talking about from supervised learning to much more uh, frontier systems or general purpose systems without getting into the AGI discussion that can do uh, more than one discrete task or are better at a range of tasks. When you and I are writing your papers at the Belfer Center, uh, neither of us used the word transformer in our papers That's right. because the transformer, which is the fundamental algorithm that underpins large language models today, was not invented yet in 2017. And I think you know, used to work at DoD. If you went to our, your colleagues at DoD and said, well, what do you think about all this AI stuff? They would say correctly, well, we've been doing AI for a long time. In fact, we funded all of the AI work in the 1960s and 70s and 80s. Uh, and we use supervised learning all the time in the Department of Defense through the Jake and the Chief Digital AI Officer and all of that. And what the NSM is getting at is saying, that's good. That's really good. But that's also not enough. And we need to keep up with the shifting paradigm where we have these large scale general purpose uh, systems, even if they're not general intelligence, um, that have tremendous value to national security. And we need to figure out, because they're not invented uh, by the US government or funded by the US government, how we're going to bring them in. That's what the National Security Memorandum lays out. And I think it was uh, really remarkable to me, one of the things that came out of the National Security Memorandum was this consciousness about the stakes of the competition with China on this. And there's not just in the National Security Mem Memorandum, but th a through line with the Biden administration on AI policy of really a, a greater willingness to do what it takes to effectively compete with China. Um, going farther than the Trump administration did, even where it was adopting some of the tools that the Trump administration used. Um, I'm going to get there in a moment, but for a second I want to uh, linger on one of the key taskings that I think came to you personally out of the AI National Security Memorandum, which was uh, a direction to study, uh, in, in your capacity as the White House uh, Chief of Staff Office for AI, um, study the implications of AI and energy, and which is something that we've been talking about a lot today. So I believe I believe the direction was to you know, study what are the barriers to building out a lot more AI capacity, a lot of the energy to support that capacity, and you know, hey, it's been like 30 days. Are you done yet? You only have 42 more? What, what's <laughs> going on so far? I intend on using all 42 remaining days. <laughs> uh, no, this is very important to us, and I think it is fair to say that one of the characteristics of this paradigm of AI that we are in are large capital investments, um, large number of computer chips, uh, large amounts of data, and large amounts of electricity to make it all happen. And I'm not really worried about the first three, uh, at least for the United States. Uh, we have the money, we have the chips, thanks to things like the CHIPS Act and the like, uh, helping that effort. Certainly we have the data, uh, but I wanna make sure that we can build the power here in the United States to, uh, to, to build this technology here. And this administration would like to see it done with clean power. I think there's a lot of reasons to think it can be done um, with clean power, so that's a, a key uh, part of what we're trying to do as we think about the tasking that we gave to ourselves uh, in the National Security Memorandum the President gave to us uh, very directly. Uh, but this is, I think, a really key part of, of making sure the United States remains competitive. And it, having gone deep into the weeds on energy, it is worth noting the United States has really not added a lot of net new energy to the grid. We've retired dirtier energy, we've brought on clean energy, which is terrific. But we've not seen a spike in overall energy demand for the last 25 years or so. That is, in general, a good news story because it means we've gotten much more efficient. Obviously, our economic growth has continued at record paces over, uh, over that time. Uh, but it's a muscle we've got to exercise, again, to build a lot more clean energy here in the United States, not just for AI. So we have to do it because of AI, 
Uh, we have to do it because of electric vehicles and the electrification of key parts of our economy. Uh, obviously, we're very supportive of that here. And then also just the, the revitalization of manufacturing coming back to the United States, uh, which I think is, again, a great thing, but something that's going to require energy. So there's a lot of reasons why this White House, beyond just the AI folks, have focused on uh, building out uh, energy, especially clean energy, here over the last four years, and, and something we will continue to push on, uh, I'm confident, till all 42 of those days have elapsed. Could, could you help calibrate this with some numbers? Because you know we reviewed the capital investment plans of some of the largest AI providers here in the United States, Microsoft, Google, OpenAI, Amazon, and they're planning on deploying $300 billion yeah. worth of capital expenditures yeah. focused on data centers for AI and energy infrastructure for AI in 2025. I mean, that's... That's almost half the DOD budget. Aren't you glad the government's not paying for it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it turned out pretty well. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, what, what is your role? What can you actually do? Because on the one hand, the, the private sector is writing the checks, and a lot of the painful regulations that make this so hard exist at the state and local mm -hmm. level. So what really can you in the um, Office of the White House Chief of Staff or coordinating with the interagency process, what tools do you even have available to, to, to whack this problem? The first thing we did, uh, actually even prior to the NSM because we knew it was coming, was the White House Chief of Staff, uh, the National Security Advisor, the Director of the National Economic Council, uh, all convened the AI CEOs, uh, chip companies, data center companies who actually build the data centers themselves, and utilities uh, in September for a very in-depth conversation about uh, what are the problems, what are the bottlenecks, and the like. We have tried to provide assistance uh, in the permitting process. I will skip some of the specifics uh, for now, but I think it's fair to say we've had success um, in doing that, and companies have told us this is, the government is moving faster on permitting, uh, federal permitting and also state and local where we can help there. So we are, we are happy with how that is going. I think it is just a start, but the, before we get to any kind of other potential actions, um, that is something we've done already, is, is convening and then making sure the government just moves a lot faster um, in processing these permits. It doesn't mean we're lowering environmental standards, doesn't mean we're lowering labor standards, doesn't mean any of that. It just means we are making sure that government's moving uh, as fast as the companies and other stakeholders are ready to move. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's worth saying when the chief of staff's office cares about something, and certainly when, when Jeff Zients, the chief of staff, cares about something, the government does move much faster. And yeah. I think for better or for worse, one of the through lines in our AI policy, which is really at the direction of the president, is you have to move at the pace that technology is moving or you're, we're going to be left in the dust. Okay, and uh, you know, you don't have to tell us, but I think uh, it's plausible, right, that this is one of those things where you have 42 days left and you're going to use all of them. We're going to use them uh, all. To, I'm, I'm happy to say that. Yeah, that's great. So, so uh, we'll be on the lookout for, for your actions related to, at the intersection of AI and energy. I want to ask the... You don't really have to persuade me because I, I want it built in the United States, but I kind of want to hear it from your mouth. What is the reason why this needs to take place in the United States? Um, you know, data centers traditionally involve a lot of job creation when you're constructing the data center, and then some jobs, but not nearly as many, uh, when you're operating the data center. So what is, what, what is the strategic interest of the United States in making sure that this massive energy build out, that this massive data center build out occurs in the United States as opposed to across the border in Canada, right? We would still have all the frontier AI labs, but you know, in this scenario, they would have the data centers. Or other countries like the UAE right, have said, we want to be a, a big partner for the United States in building out data centers. So, when does it matter that it take place in the United States? When does it not matter that it take place in the United States? And what sort of criteria are you using for evaluating that kind of decision? Well, we're not picking the sites of, of individual data centers. Up. So companies have, have some freedom to go where they want to go. But I think it's just making sure the United States is um, hospitable to this kind of work. And obviously, we will do some of this work with allies and partners. Our companies already do. Google has a huge presence, for example, in the United Kingdom. Um, oh, I think all the companies have a huge presence in Canada as well. So it, it is not to, to be totally protectionist about this, um, but it is to say that we want to make sure that it's, it is possible to build it here. I think in general, uh, if you look at the history of our technology economy, when we've sent things like chip manufacturing overseas, we have regretted it, and that is a lesson that I think this president has, has taken on board and has worked very hard to reverse. So I think that probably weighs on some of the AI conversation as well. But it is about making sure that the United States remains competitive uh, uh, 
as, as this technology, which we think is be very important for security and economic purposes, continues to, to push on forward. Yeah. So in our previous panel, we heard uh, some of these folks talking about what the Trump administration might want to continue. I mean, we, we've heard the Trump campaign said pretty clearly in their platform their goal is revoking the AI executive order as soon as possible. Um, but as we heard from our previous panelists, they might pick and choose you know, some elements of the AI executive order that are still appealing to them. And within the AI National Security Memorandum, I feel very confident that they're going to want to continue this work stream related to making the United States more competitive uh, when it comes to energy, when it comes to the intersection of AI and energy. So I think that's all there. As you, I mean, I don't want to ask you to sort of pick amongst your children, yeah. but if we were to talk about uh, you know, repealing the AI executive <laughs> order, um, what are the things that you think are just like, it, it absolutely has to continue? You know, there, there's something critical in there that uh, you, you'd break something really important if you didn't continue it. Um, so implicitly, what, am I, what do I want them to repeal? Is that the question? No, the opposite. <laughs> what, do, what do you want them to uh, repeal? But, but uh, what I, whatever I omit is on the chopping block. I suppose that's fair, yeah. Um, I get the politics of this. I understand what's at the, the party platform. Um, I'm a university professor before I did this, so a national security professional, uh, not doing the politics of the details. I think when folks look at what our AI policy is and the incoming team, the things we have tried to prioritize, doing it here, making sure we have the infrastructure to do it, making sure the systems are safe, making sure we bring in the kind of talent we need to, to do that, taking all that technology and putting it in the US government national security apparatus so we can use this uh, in our competition, especially with China, making sure the Chinese don't build this technology uh, on their own. I think there'll be far more continuity than, than not continuity. And I think, I imagine we probably, we probably disagree with uh, the Trump team on some of the contours of, of how AI applies to, um, you know, some of the, the domestic agencies and the like, that's, that's you know, that they'll get to make their decisions on that. But I think on a lot of the big thrusts of the executive order and the National Security Memorandum, when you look at the details, these are not particularly partisan ideas. Yeah, and I, th I think it's really interesting that you mentioned that because the first Trump administration, I remember uh, both in my time as a civil servant and uh, serving in the Department of Defense during the first Trump administration, and then also in my time as a think tanker uh, during the first Trump administration, AI was a pretty bipartisan issue at the time. And if you look back in what was in the Trump AI executive orders, they included a focus on AI safety. Um, yeah. They included a focus on developing standards. Um, and if you think about you know, one of the key things that came out of uh, to a certain extent, the AI executive order, but especially in the AI National Security Memorandum, you have the AI Safety Institute. Um, and where does it live? In the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Which is totally non-regulatory. Exactly. So there's no, there's no binding anything from the AI Safety Institute. All the AI Safety Institute says is, uh, US government's open for business. We are bringing our national security expertise to American companies who can, on a 100% voluntary basis, work with us uh, and sign a memorandum of understanding to figure out what that relationship looks like. Two companies, two leading AI companies, OpenAI and Anthropic, um, have been impressed enough with the expertise we have brought to bear, including people who have invented some of the fundamental techniques in artificial intelligence, like Paul Cristiano, to say, we'd like to give our systems to you before they're released to the public so we can walk, walk through them together, as, including O1, OpenAI system that was released Today's Monday, Friday. Uh, the days are, all 42 days are blurring. Um, so the, that, that is the, the voluntary, totally non-regulatory relationship um, that we have between the AS Safety Institute and the companies. I, I don't see why that's not a bipartisan thing. Yeah, and there's you know, some analogs you could make to the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration, right. where it's like, these, this safety testing is voluntary, but I promise you all of your customers are gonna want you to do it. And by the same token, we have this AI Safety Institute, which has this voluntary opportunity for pre-deployment uh, safety testing, and at least so far, uh, the companies seem interested. The, I think everything I've heard from the companies is, is mainly companies that they're interested. I also get it a lot from the, the employees at the companies mm. who are saying there are parts of AI and AI safety that we know very well, and there's parts that we don't. And uh, sure, we hear from the executives at the companies, but also the folks actually building it are saying, you know, we don't have a lot of expertise in this company about the intersection between AI and bio, for example. Mm -hmm. The US government's thought about biology for a very long time. And if you can bring in experts from the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense, uh, to, to help us, we're grateful. 
Yeah. So uh, the last time I saw you was in San Francisco uh, at the first convening of the International Network of AI Safety Institutes. And I think it's you know, noteworthy that this is not just a sort of domestic effort of uh, the Biden administration on AI policy, but also an international one. So talk to me about your reaction from that event and what you sort of see as the future of this network. One of the things in the executive order that I'm quite confident the Trump team and I agree on is the importance of trying to have one standard. What we hear from our industry all the time is we don't want 50 standards in the United States and we don't want 193 standards around the world. So whatever we can do to harmonize technical standards, safety standards in this nascent field will help us go faster with this technology. And we've taken this to heart. This is called out explicitly as an objective in the AI executive order and again in the National Security Memorandum. And it's an objective as part of the international convening where we say it's not something the United States is just going to do uh, by itself and uh, developing these standards. And we want to do this with allies and partner nations. Frankly, a lot of nations around the world are looking to the United States for our expertise um, in doing this. And a lot of them are contributing their own expertise. So the, the kickoff event uh, a couple weeks ago in San Francisco was 10 uh, nations that have set up essentially AI Safety Institute or equivalents um, coming together to talk about developing technical standards in this space. And again, I, I think that is um, nonpartisan uh, work that is important for national security, but also important for economic competitiveness, and I certainly hope it continues. Yeah. And just zooming out a bit and thinking about the international landscape of AI policy, um, the Biden administration really has, I mean, I, I've heard it from folks in the administration, maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but I've heard that uh, President Biden has not had a meeting with a foreign head of state in several years where AI wasn't on the agenda. I mean, it's literally everybody wants to talk. He has not included me in all of his foreign heads of state <laughs> meetings, so I can't uh, speak for, with comps on that, but I think it is fair to say in my conversations with him and as he has talked to the public about this, yeah. he talks all the time how this is something that foreign heads of states bring up and something where he, is, he has his views. And I think probably the best articulation of his views in the international context was what he said at the UN General Assembly just a couple months ago, mm -hmm. where he's talking. You know, this, he's got just a few minutes with the international community and, and what is he talking about, amongst many other things, is AI. Yeah. Um, and I think it's reflective of the foreign interest here. And you know, how would you describe at a high level the Biden administration's approach to international diplomacy when it concerns AI. You know, we had uh, Jennifer Baucus here earlier mm -hmm. in the day, uh, representing the sort of State Department yep. perspective. But, um, you know, zooming out at the White House level, at the, the whole of the nation level, what do you think the United States needs to engage allies and partners with on AI? What do you think the United States needs to in it, uh, engage with the, what you might call the unaligned world uh, when it comes to AI and, of course, with our uh, competitors and potential adversaries? I don't know if I've said this part publicly, but the mantra of our international work on AI has been lead with substance. And I think embedded in that are two very important ideas. The first is that clearly the United States has some role to play. These are fundamentally American AI companies uh, making this technology with American uh, design chips, uh, often you know, almost exclusively at this point in the United States. So we, we have a, an indispensable role here that we are not going to shirk. Uh, but we also have to bring substance to the table. And I think that's what we've tried to do in a bunch of different international settings. Probably the first big one was the G7 Code of Conduct, uh, which we rolled out the same day in close partnership with the Japanese government and the Hiroshima process, um, the same day the president signed the executive order. This G7 Code of Conduct is built heavily upon the voluntary commitments our companies made to us. So again, totally non-regulatory, but taking the input from our industry, using that as the basis for international agreement, getting the G7 nations to sign up. Um, in a broader setting, uh, there's the UN General Assembly resolution, the first ever one passed on AI, passed unanimously, 193 nations um, uh, voted for it or uh, supported it, uh, no, no one voted against, uh, I think there's 123 co-sponsors, including China. Uh, so that's a, a much broader tent, but another place where we've tried to show up and lead with substance internationally. And we've just talked as well about the AI Safety Institute convenings and the like and, uh, with that group. I think probably on top of that, and as there, as you know well, is the work the Department of Defense does with the Partnership for Defense, close uh, like-minded nations, uh, talking about AI in the military context, and then the political declaration on the use of AI in military systems, which articulates our view for how um, AI should and shouldn't be used in the context of warfare and intelligence. Uh, which has been signed by 56 nations around the world. Which I think is, is kind of remarkable 
that you were able to achieve that and, and the time frame in which you were able to achieve it because I remember uh, the United Nations Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons group of yeah, governmental yeah, yeah. experts on lethal autonomous yeah. weapons was commissioned to just come up with a definition of the term then they expanded their mandate to secure an international ban, and 10 years later they had neither defined the term nor secured an international ban. Uh, but the Biden administration, you know, just taking the first whack at it, managed to persuade 56 like-minded countries, um, you know, what would constitute responsible versus irresponsible use of these types of technologies in a military context. I think we are not alone in feeling a lot of pressure to move quickly uh, to manage this technology. Uh, we, the United States is bringing indispensable substance to the table, but we are very fortunate to work with a lot of allies and partners and, and of, of the these six non-aligned states too, um, who might not always agree with us on everything, but who see the value in what we're trying to do here. Yeah. So obviously a lot of the context for your decision making on the international dimensions of AI policy comes back to US competition with China. Um, from my own perspective, I really viewed uh, October 7th, 2022, when the Biden administration launched a new series of export controls on the chips that are used to train advanced AI models, as well as the chip making technologies that are used to make those chips. To me, that seems like a seminal moment mm -hmm. um, in US foreign policy. I would say of the two biggest decisions that the Biden administration made in its foreign policy in 2022, backing Ukraine, being number one, I think number two would be these export controls. I mean, I really think uh, when we look back 50 years from now on what mattered in U.S. foreign policy in 2022, I think it's going to have a strong case to be there. Secretary of State Tony Blinken, uh, giving a speech you know, a few days after those controls came out, said that the post-Cold War era is over, we're in a new era, and at the heart of that uh, competition in this new era is going to be technology. So it seems like the Biden administration sort of recognized the stakes of that competition. You know, walk us through the decision to, to launch this new types of export controls, and then I'm gonna ask you to comment a bit on the more, the more recent ones. But first, I want you to um, sort of walk us through how the Biden administration reached that decision back in October 2022 that this, this needed to happen. Yeah, I think there was a, a group of folks, uh, myself included, but certainly not limited to me, people like Tarun Chabra, um, Chris McGuire, and, and the like, who, who were thinking about uh, the importance of AI for the future of international um, affairs and for national security and competition uh, with China in particular. And we're thinking about the importance of computing power in that AI paradigm, again, this paradigm shift within AI, and recognize that actually the United States hand here is extraordinarily strong, uh, obviously in partnership with uh, uh, Taiwan and uh, Korea, Japan, the Netherlands, other parts of the, the global supply chain. Um, so recognize that this was an opportunity to make sure we were not going to sell to China uh, the kinds of chips that it would use to modernize its military, deploy uh, weapons and technologies that ultimately would, would hurt American uh, warfighters and American national security interests, and also I think the national security interests of our allies and partners around the world. So that was the genesis of this. Obviously, nothing like that happens without a lot of bureaucratic process, you know that. <laughs> uh, so there was a lot of time spent making sure the details were as close to right as they could be for a first cut at a policy like that. But you know, as, I, as my time in this administration draws to a close, I have been reflecting more than maybe I did a couple of years ago when we were in the thick of it on decisions like that and policies like that. And this is trite to say, but it's completely true. I give folks like the National Security Advisor uh, and the president a ton of credit for being willing to hear this argument from a bunch of tech folks, really dive into the details in, in a significant way, and then make, a, I think, a, as you said, very significant decision. Long, you know, all before ChatGPT. It wasn't like AI was on everyone's radar at the time, uh, but I think, it, I think it's something that ultimately uh, we, are, we are proud of, and, and we've refined, of course, but um, the strategic shift embedded in that decision is something that but speaking for myself, and I think the broader administration team, uh, we're proud of it. So I want to ask about um, the before chat GPT thing that you just mentioned, because I do think it's noteworthy that these controls came out October 7th, 2022. In November of 2022 is sort of the chat GPT uh, explosion, right? The entire, the eyes of the world are upon the USAI industry because of, uh, you know, chat GPT going from zero to hundreds of millions of users in a, in a matter of days. And... 
from my perspective, the, the justification of the October 2022 export controls as it's written in the legislation, um, you know, really focuses on the fact that uh, China was using US GPU technology in its military systems. That's not really up for debate. Like, like the, the procurement records are out there. You can yep. go look, China admitted to this. Um, they were using it to modernize their nuclear weapons uh, development as well as their nuclear weapons delivery mechanisms. That's also not really up for debate. It's out there. Uh, you can go read the records. Um, but what was not, in, and I want to say this is something that's just always important to remember, is there's the justifications that you are required by law to put in the policy in order to access the relevant legal authorities, but there's no requirement that it be all of the reasons that were in your mind. And so I want to ask you, you know, the National Security Memorandum, which really is focusing on frontier AI, really is focusing on this revolution. Um, so it's clear that the Biden administration cares a lot about frontier AI circa 2024. I want to ask, was that on your mind in 2022? Were you sort of seeing the writing on the wall that these increasingly general purpose, these increasingly larger, increasingly more diversely capable models were coming down the pike and that there were big national security implications and that if we were going to have any kind of strategic effect, we needed to move quickly? Was that on your mind? I don't want to speak for other people because I did not have this conversation with other folks. Certainly, I have had conviction about uh, the importance of AI. Uh, for national security and the importance of computing power uh, in AI since before I was Right, you wrote a paper called yeah. the AI Triad about right. data, and compute. A, there's a foreign affairs piece, the US AI competition all wrong about basically, it's not about data is the new oil, it's about computing power. So my cards are on the table as a professor, <laughs> for better or for worse, since before yeah. I was in the government. I will let others in the government decide how they, what they were thinking in 2022. I do think it's the case that certainly when we were talking to folks in the government about this, the, the, the facts that you just mentioned were indisputable, and that's kind of all you need, I think. Mm -hmm. What else people were thinking about, I leave to them, but, but there's no doubt, there's, not, there's no doubt in my mind, and it hasn't been down in my mind for a while, about the importance of frontier AI for national security and the importance of computing power for frontier AI. Yeah, I, I, if I could, uh, you know, you have 40, 40 days left of tough work ahead of you, but if I could sort of get in, back, get in a time machine and go back to October 2022, there's a lot of preamble in the AI NSM that sort of justifies why all these actions are being taken that would have been lovely to include in the October 7th regulations <laughs> because they, they do... The, what, would have, what would have been different if we, if we had the preamble you wanted in October 2022? What would have so, been different? Uh, Other well, than I'll, giving you two years more to, you know... Well, you know, my papers would have been better. <laughs> sure, that's, sure. I'm sure that's what you were optimizing for. But, um, no, I... I think the, the, the connection to allies would have been easier. I think the October 7th policy makes so much more sense once you've read the AI NSM. It, you know, because the AI NSM articulates a Biden administration worldview about the centrality of compute in national security AI competition that I think um, was implicit in the October 7th, 2022 export controls, but was not explicitly articulated. And I think it, we might have had an easier time, I mean, who knows, I don't have that time machine, but we might have had an easier time explaining to the rest of our allies why we were doing this if that implicit had been made explicit. Maybe. Um, I don't know that I would look to dense regulatory documents on export controls <laughs> for, for my explanation of why things yeah. are the way they are. I do think Jake, I mean, I know Jake gave a speech, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, gave a speech in September of 2022, yep. so right before this, which was kind of the preview. This is the small yard high fence uh, speech, Yeah, and also yeah. he talks about the, the fundamental areas of competition. He talks about computing power, uh, biology, and clean energy as, the, I think his phrase is, as large a lead as possible, basically, like saying, this is where we are going to put our uh, focus so we, we did try to do, and really senior folks like Jake did try to do an articulation at the time, um, but sure, it's not in the, the filing from the Bureau of Industry and Security, that's true. Yeah, um, and I'm sure you know, all of our allies were closely reading those documents at a very narrow They were probably focusing on Jake's speech. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably fair to say. Um, so now as you think about uh, those export controls, you know, most of that policy was written uh, about China. Um, but it does have implications for our interactions with a lot of other countries. So, Sorry, can we just do one more thing on Alice? Oh, please, I please. wanted to, to clarify this. One of the things I think that, that we are proud about the October 7th thing is how allies came along. Mm. So especially on the SME side, which is actually not something that I particularly, I, I leave that to other experts, but nations like the Netherlands and Japan, after we took the first step, joined with us yes. in, in doing that. So I do think 
you can sequence the documents wherever you want to sequence the documents. Uh, you should judge our record on export controls with China, not just on what did the United States do unilaterally, but how did the international community of nations that are actually building the stuff work together over the last four years yeah. to, to do this. And I think that, more than anything, will be a legacy of which uh, this team is proud. And again, I could take no personal credit for it, but that is something that I think is an important part of holistically looking at what did we do. It is not just the United States alone. Yeah. As you think about you know, the, ex the approach to export controls that you've had and the way that it interacted with the multilateral concerns that you've had, I mean, I think it makes, it's crystal clear you know, to the United States that um, if we're going to stop selling something to China and then an ally or a partner is going to sell that exact same equivalent good to China and well, we basically lost a lot of American company revenue and we've had no strategic impact on China. So you really do need to have a strategy for bringing allies and partners you know, along if you want to do this. I want to ask if um, the means that we've taken, if you were to sort of consider advising the Trump administration on how to think about export controls in the context of AI national security competition, I want to give you one contrast. So the Wassenaar arrangement, which is the primary post-Cold War multilateral export control framework, it is a consensus mechanism. Everybody has to agree for the export controls to apply to anybody. Um, by contrast, the, the Cold War era export control system, COCOM, was a veto-based system. You know, uh, if one country said that we don't want these exports to the Soviet Union to happen, they didn't happen. Greece could block the United States exporting to the Soviet uh, Union. So we've gone from a, uh, a veto-based system to a consensus-based system. And I think, you know, the, the performance of the veto-based system in holding back the Soviet Union is much stronger. I mean, when the, when the Soviet Union fell, I think Moscow had five long-distance phone lines Five people could call long distance in the Soviet Union at a time uh, out of Moscow because their technology was so backward. I mean, it was really helpful that they didn't have access to all of this dual use technology that the, the United States had. And so I want to ask is, on the one hand, I want to you know, commend you, uh, you and the Biden administration, for, for being multilateral. And I just want to ask, realistically, is it enough? You know, are, or do we need to consider um, you know, more extraordinary measures like the COCOM approach that we had during the Cold War? I don't know that we need the COCOM approach. I do think we have shown we are willing to act first and make the case to allies and partners and then have them come along. I mean, October 7th was a Move first. unilateral action, yeah. um, but then it was followed by allies and partners coming along. So I think we have been comfortable, the revealed preference at least, is that we have been comfortable uh, with, that, with mm -hmm. that approach. We're not going to design a new regime in, in the 42 remaining days, so I, I don't know how the Trump team will want to play it, but I do think... You know, certainly our track record suggests that we will not hesitate in the cases where uh, the United States national security is at stake. And I am grateful that I think in a lot of those cases, allies and partners have um, either seen right away or come to see it the same way. And this has been, a, a, I think, a really true partnership. So in those October 7th export controls, you were trying to restrict AI chips being sold to China so that they could not train the most advanced AI models, so that they could not operate the most advanced AI models, so that we could preserve our sort of edge uh, in a meaningful sense. These most recent round of export controls uh, that came out on December 2nd, so not, not too long ago at all, um, expanded it from the logic side of AI chips to high bandwidth memory. And I want to understand because you know, some folks have said that memory is more of a dual use technology, the sort of connection to uh, military stuff, the types of justifications that export controls normally rely upon is a little bit more tenuous. So could you just sort of explain why did you feel the need to include high bandwidth memory in this most recent round of export controls? So full disclosure, this is not a, not a regulation I worked on. Um, but I think the, the insight here is we want to make sure the export controls and our policy in general is grounded in the technology. And I think it is certainly the case if you look at um, AI chips over the last couple of years, to a degree that what was starting to be the case in 2022, but really has accelerated um, in its significance, the importance of high bandwidth memory uh, is, is vital in those chips. So this is a way of getting at um, a really important part of the ecosystem including for training large systems that we had not addressed before. So I, that is probably, I think, the, the technical impetus for, for doing this in, in that way. Yeah, and I think it's something that the Trump team will, I'm sure, look at and say, did they go far enough? Did they not go uh, 
uh, you know, did they go too far? And they can figure out their own take on the technology. But again, this I think is pretty clearly the, the reveal of preference of this administration on that particular part of the technical stack. Yep. And so the last uh, connection to the export controls is, of course, these export controls are uh, not exclusively, but you know, principally targeted at China uh, and the Chinese AI ecosystem. But they have effects on the, the wider world um, because now places that didn't used to require an export license to receive NVIDIA chips or NVIDIA's competitors' chips, um, now they do. You know, one area where this has come up, and there was some reporting over the weekend uh, in Axios about this, um, is the UAE, which evidently has now received export licenses to buy a lot of NVIDIA chips uh, to build some new data centers locally in partnership with Microsoft. So I don't necessarily want to ask you to comment on the UAE deal specifically, but I want you to sort of zoom out and think about that higher level uh, principles that the United States government should be operating under. You know, when we have these export controls, when we're controlling who gets American designed chips to build data centers, what should sort of the criteria that we use uh, to make those kind of decisions? Yeah, I think, I think this is a case where Jake talked about some of this actually in the speech where he unveiled the NSM and suggested, I think, that we would have more to say on this. So mm -hmm. more to say on this. But I do think in general it is worth saying we want to make sure, above all, the chips are not diverted to China. So we want to know some sense of uh, where the chips are going, who is using them, probably have some thoughts on the number of chips and so forth. But without commenting on any particular report of licenses granted or not granted, I think it is fair to say um, you know, our companies have partnered uh, with nations in that region uh, to do some work there. And I think this was a, a, a prominent theme of the um, Saudi AI Day, which I think was in October, that announced a significant Google partnership and the like. So. Uh, bearing in mind all of our thoughts about U.S. competitiveness and U.S. lead and, and doing it whatever we can here um, in the United States, we recognize that there is a degree to which um, AI is going to be global and, and American companies are global businesses and there's reasons why you'd want to have at least some data centers around the world and uh, we are trying to build a policy uh, that, that allows for that while also making sure we are protecting U.S. interests and, and making sure that a lot of chips don't end up um, in a PLA data center. Yeah. And so you now... I said this was the last question on export controls, but now I guess I'm lying um, because I have one more. Um, you know, you, you've talked a little, about, a little bit about unfinished business and, and some things that might be coming. One thing that I noted was not in the most recent update to export controls was addressing some of the other reports that we've seen uh, in, in the public. So we've seen reports in the Information and the New York Times about pretty large scale AI chip smuggling uh, going to China. Um, we've also seen reporting about how uh, TSMC, the Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturer, had been manufacturing AI chips for Huawei uh, and then shipping those back to China, which is just like a five alarm fire in my, in my mind, you know, for, for how these export controls are gonna work. So I'm curious, you know, number one, um, how concerned are you by, by what you've seen that you know, those types of behaviors undermine the strategic logic of the export controls? I, I think it's safe to say if they, could, if they can infinitely smuggle, then the export controls will not be effective. Um, but you know, from what you've seen, uh, how, how concerned should we be? Uh, obviously, we want it all to stop, but I'm just trying to see like, how, how significant is the impact to date. And then second, you know, why wasn't something in the export controls to address uh, smuggling, to make it a little bit more difficult? Why wasn't something in the export controls to address you know, what TSMC did and to make that more difficult in the future? Well, this one, this export controls is focused on a different piece of the problem. So again, I, I'm not sure I'd expect to see it here, but it is fair to say, obviously, that as my uh, commerce colleagues at the Bureau of Industry and Security are very fond of saying is, you don't dam half a river, right? So there, there's not a lot of point in, in undertaking these kinds of efforts um, if we can't make sure that they're effective. And not coming on particular reports, it's obvious that this is an area where we have to continue to act to ensure the effectiveness. We'll see what we can do before we are we're done here. Particular investigations into particular companies are not something the White House actually is in the loop on, and, and or and shouldn't be. Frankly, this, this is a the separation of law enforcement and fire, fire, politics, firewalled yeah. away from um, the White House Chief of Staff's office, as it absolutely should be. Uh, so I, I genuinely don't have an answer for you there. But this is an area where I think this is something that that it is fundamental to our policy is making sure we are enforcing these um, in a really robust way. 
And if we, if we don't enforce them in a robust way, as you said, it will threaten the strategic logic of the policy itself. Well, uh, if I wasn't convinced before, this conversation has crystallized the fact that this was the wrong time to have this conversation, because you are <laughs> profoundly not done. This is not your exit interview, so I'll see you on January 21st, I'm sure, uh, where we're going to have the real one. But. Uh, while we are in this period of transition, um, I wanted to give you the, the last word and, and say, what is your advice for the Trump administration as they inherit this very difficult, rapidly changing policy portfolio? What's, uh, what's your advice to the Trump administration AI team? They're, they are being given, I think, a, a fascinating task. I think in many respects, we have laid a foundation. Uh, we have taken actions that we are proud of that I think have enhanced US national security and US competitiveness. Um, but a lot of the really vital decisions on AI, on chips, and the like are still to come. Um, I happen to think a lot of those are places where even Republicans and Democrats who disagree on many, many things can agree. Uh, and we have done everything we can to ensure an orderly professional transition uh, on these points. But I think the, the through line in all of that decision making uh, that, that we have made and that they will have to make is getting the technical detail and then marrying that to the broader geopolitical uh, implications and strategic implications. Um, so recognizing the importance of chips to begin with, recognizing the importance of AI to begin with, recognizing that it's actually not data that's the, the new oil, but it's this other part of the stack. Um, updating it to include HBM. Uh, a lot of what we've done with the intersection of AI and bio or the work of the AI Safety Institute, we have tried to ground our policy as much as possible in the technical, sometimes boring, sometimes prosaic, certainly nonpartisan detail. And whatever their broader philosophical views, I think there's a lot um, that will be gained if they, if they do the same thing. And I think even on the broader philosophical front, um, there's a lot on the national security side here, uh, the China competition side here, about which we absolutely agree. And then I'm more than happy in my remaining time and then going forward to help them get it right for the United States. If they want a meeting, you'll say yes. Happy to say yes. <laughs> Great. Um, well, uh, after this, we have the ambassador to the United States uh, from France, who's going to deliver our closing keynote, which is extremely exciting. Uh, if you could all please stay seated. We're going to just change out the stage to get ready for that <laughs> session. It'll just be a few minutes. Uh, but in the meantime, could you join me in strongly thanking Dr. Ben Buchanan?